so Bruce, the last time we talked a lot about uh, GSP and Michael Bisping and if it was going to happen, and obviously you've just come back from UFC 217. How was that for you? I thought that UFC 217, uh, on paper, I thought it had the chance to be the best pay-per-view of the year, which it was. But quite frankly, in my 21 plus years of announcing, I am calling 217 in the top 10 pay-per-views of all historical time in the UFC. Um, I've been announced thousands of fights, as you know. I've been announcing since UFC 8 uh, from beginning to end, ending with the, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, George St. Pierre, who established that, in my opinion, that Saturday night. Um, was it a perfect, perfect show? And when have you had a show with three championships where each champion holding the belt loses their crown? Not that I wish that to happen, but the drama was unbelievable. Ioana Janjacek's fight with Rose Namanunas had all of us with our jaws on the floor and our eyes popping out. It was it was unbelievable. Well, some people called that the biggest shock of the full card, that Rose managed to dethrone one of the most dominant women champions that people have seen. I agree. Um, Rose came out, and I again, I don't bet fights. I'm an equal opportunity announcer. I don't bet fights. Not when I'm working. I'm I just not my thing. But the odds makers that they always talk about, Rose came out at like five to one. And I think when the fight went off, she was a nine to one underdog. Mm -hmm. And it was very similar, you know, in respect to what people didn't expect when Ronda Rousey fought Holly Holm. You know, a, a lot of people didn't realize that Holly had that ability. Um, here, Rose comes up against, uh, you know, the biggest fight of her life. And it just it just came out. I mean, she didn't give Joanna a chance to breathe. Didn't give Joanna a chance to set. One, if you want to have a chance to set, get her distance down and throw those front kicks and jabs and uh, straight crosses, it would have been a very long night for Rose. But she did not give her a chance to even get set in that fight. It was explosive, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was. There's going to be a rematch, or there's, there's rumors that there, there has to be a rematch because Joanna was, so, was such a dominant champion. How do you reckon that's going to go? Well, I'd love to see a rematch, and in a rematch this situation, you're not going to see the same fight. Uh, come out. Whether you see the same outcome, that remains to be seen. May the best woman win on that night. But Joanna's going to go back to the drawing board. Our coaches are going to sit down with her. They're going to analyze Rose's what Rose did, what put her off, and they're going to counteract that as best they can. Do you think, I've, I've heard a lot of MMA analysts say that the women's division, when someone was so dominant, the rest of the division, it was the same thing that happened with Ronda that she was such a dominant champion that no one had ever seen anything like her. And then the rest of the just women's MMA got better and caught up to the champion. Do you reckon that was similar to what happened with Joanna? Well, you got to remember that Rose, uh, that can be said also in the in the Demetrius' 125-pound mm -hmm. flyweight yeah. division. You can say that about a couple other divisions. When John Jones was champion light heavyweight, we were saying that about the light heavyweight division. Um, that's, what, that's what an ultimate champion does is they reign. They're on the top of the hill. And it's a matter of the old game we played as kids. It's king of the hill. Who's going to come up and knock me off the top of the hill? In the fighting game, especially in the octagon, even more so than the boxing ring, in my opinion, the way matches are set up, anybody can win on any given night. And that's the beauty of mixed martial arts and the beauty of the octagon and also the drama and the mysteriousness of the octagon and the UFC warriors that enter that. So it's not about being surprised as much. It's about, again, you have to realize that every fight you watch may the best man or woman win, which is my standard answer when I'm asked who's going to win because, honestly, you never know. Sure, you can say Demetrius will defeat everybody, blah, 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 and, you know, he's one of the also one of the goats or greatest of all times in our sport, too. Mm -hmm. um, what's going to happen if Demetrius goes up to 135 and fights T.J. Dillashaw? You know, it's like, that's the beauty of it, where you're in store for so much entertainment. Do you think that Demetrius stands, I mean, we've, we've discussed that he's the, he's the greatest of all time, especially after that. Uh, suplex to armbar that he pulled off. But do you think he has a real chance against Dillashaw after Dillashaw looked so dominant against Cody? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if the greatest of all time steps up 10 pounds heavier, let me ask you a question. Would you think he would have a chance also? Yes, I do. Ab absolutely, More absolutely. So people always bring up the fact that he, he moved up a division and lost. But af after seeing him break the record and progress more as a fighter even though he was so good initially I, he just looked something else yes uh most definitely um 
I really would love to see TJ and Demetrius go at it because, again, it's who in the division of flyweight is going to be able to beat Demetrius right now. That would create tremendous excitement. And also at the same time where people complain that, oh, well, not enough people want to see Demetrius fight as great as he is. Well, you put him up against TJ Dillashaw, then you're creating a not just a championship defense um, where a man can hold two belts. You're creating a spectacle uh, of a pay-per-view and that or a super fight in its own route. So that fight would be a huge draw and a great main event. Well, speaking of super fights, I was going to ask, the term gets thrown around a lot, but do you think that is the prime definition of a super fight? They oh, those two? Be- yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Those mm-hmm. two would be the definition of a super fight because of the fact that you are having a man go up in his weight, 10 pounds, uh, to fight TJ Dillashaw, who's regained the championship, dramatically so, mm-hmm. and then the winner could fight Cody Gobrandt. Go to Garbrandt again, you know, or whoever's due that position. Or he goes back down to 125. Demetrius could easily, in my opinion, if he reigns successful, just thinking theoretically, if he reigns successful at 135, he could hold both those belts for a while. It would be an amazing achievement by a warrior. Once he's conquered that division, though, where else is there for Demetrius to go? Because he's he'd practically conquered everything put in front of him if he were to claim that belt. I'll, I'll say it again, Harry. Remember, we played as kids, King of the Hill. Exactly. King of the Hill, baby. It's all about who's on top of that mountain, and that's what life's all about, whether you're in business, uh, whether you're playing cricket, or whether you're playing as a team, you know, whether you're boxing or whether you're fighting MMA. It's about King of the Hill. Who's going to stay on top of the hill? Well, someone who's on top of the hill at the moment is your friend George. Where do you see him going next? Because there's a lot of talk. I mean, because the UFC needed a big cash cow, in a lot of people's opinions. Because McGregor draw has huge draws, but a, the draw the size of George St. Pierre is huge. Do you think he's going to defend the belt, or do you reckon they're just going to pitch him up for a super fight? You know, George, is, George obviously made a tremendous amount of money the other week. Mm-hmm. A tremendous amount of money. George has a tremendous amount of money. But what George has is he's the most disciplined, finest example of a martial artist, finest example of a UFC champion, finest example of a role model who doesn't curse, who doesn't get up there and play games, who is loved by everybody, I don't know who doesn't like George, who proved himself to the naysayers that George St. Pierre's fights can be a little boring, those people out there, oh, he's winning all the time, he's a little boring. You know what? He's winning. He's calculated. But he wasn't boring two weeks ago, right? So we all want to see George fight again. And then I'm thinking, what fight would I like to see? Um, would I like to see George defend the belt? Of course I would. Would I like to see George have a super fight? I was dreaming of a super fight with Anderson Silva due to latest developments. I don't think that's ever even going to be in the cards yeah. um, with the recent situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so at this point, as I always say about Conor McGregor, I always say it's Conor's world and we live in it. We'll see what happens. You know what? It's now George St. Pierre's world. And we're living in it. Let's see what George wants to do. He's going to make a calculated decision. Hopefully he didn't suffer any serious injuries. I haven't heard anything about such. And um, he'll make a very calculated thing. But I guarantee you the fight that he fights is going to be a fight that's going to draw over a million pay-per-view buys. Because it's going to be either a defense or a super fight or maybe a challenge for championship at a lower weight. Who knows? I'm not privy to this information. I'll be, I will find out when you find out, my friend. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, there was a lot of people theorizing that he'd go down the weight and try and fight Woodley once Woodley comes back from his shoulder injury. Do you reckon that's a realistic bout that could happen? Absolutely. No question. No question. Woodley's a monster, okay? As Michael Bisping, a true street-fighting UK warrior. You know, he's the epitome thereof. I love Michael. Um, He's a good friend, and he just stepped up to take another fight three weeks later. Yeah. That's... that's, Mm. That reminds me of the old days of boxing, back in the days. It doesn't happen today, right? And that's what we're seeing here in a warrior named Michael Bisping stepping up for Shanghai next week. So, again, all this remains to be seen, my friend. Do you feel that Michael Bisping took the fight on such short notice to fit in as many fights in his career before he inevitably retires? No. Or do you think that it's just that warrior mentality that he has inside him? It's a warrior mentality. He got a phone call, or he made a phone call, And he said, I want this, or they said, do you want this? And he simply said, yes. He stepped up to bat. His suspension was dropped from 30 to seven days so he could do it. We were just texting each other the other day when I heard about it. He's very, very up for the fight. It's a dangerous fight. 
Kelvin Gaslam is a warrior also. Kelvin Gaslam will come in and try to punch straight down the pipe once he gets his distance. A heck of a boxer as well as a ground fighter. Very, very tough fight, not only for Michael, but for Kelvin. And I respect them both for saying yes. Do you feel this is the prime opportunity for Michael to retire if he does beat Kelvin? Because it would be such a romanticized event if he does win, coming off a loss against George St. Pierre. Well, it's a romanticized place, but at the same time, he's proven himself already, right? But at the same time, Michael Bisping gets up in the morning, as any fine warrior does, looks in the mirror and says, I see a champion. So if he's given a chance to get that belt again, he's going to go for it. Outside of that, he's going to provide great entertainment for us, as he's always done. He's going to make a lot of money, which he so justly deserves. And he's probably going to get as many fights as he can in before it is that time to, you know, step out of the octagon into another business. He's got quite a career potential in, in the movie industry. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. Safety first. Financials are important. Um, but I think a couple more fights, if he's not already set the rest of his life, which he should be, he'll be more so for his children. He's a family man and he loves his children, and that's where his heart is. Well, he certainly cemented himself as the top British export to come into the UFC. I mean, the UFC's had great names, such as Brad Pickett, but I don't think any fighters have got to that height that Bisping has. Well, Brad Pickett, who has tremendous respect for me, um, I respect him, I like him, a true warrior fought a ton of fights. I even recorded his wedding introduction for him when he got married, which is one of the specialties I do uh, for fans. And, you know, again, all respect for Brad Pickett, a great representative of a UK warrior. You know how I feel about UK warriors. Naturally, you boys will drop and throw down, you know, after a couple of pints at the drop of a hat. But as skilled fighters, you take that mentality and you put it into your skill. And, and when you're a skilled fighter reigning as champion or, or looking as great, whether it's in boxing with Anthony Joshua, whether it's in MMA, uh, tremendous respect. The UK athletes, men and women, are warriors, deep down, bred in heart. And it shows every time they step in and they go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Well, you're talking about British warriors and someone who's made a big splash in the water you see at the moment is Darren Till who's local to me Yes, in, uh, from Liverpool, and he's fighting Stephen Thompson in February. Do you think he has a real chance of beating someone of Wonderboy's calibre, or do you think this is too big a jumping class for Till? No, it's, again, the, the higher you step, the better you show, because what's going to make you a better fighter and create a better fight is to fight somebody that takes you to another level, right? That in training, he takes you to another level. Then when you step in the octagon against him, you fight at another level. Darren Till seems to be, and I don't know Darren personally, beyond saying hello, but Darren Till seems like the kind of warrior that will get better and better with each fight. His confidence level is extremely high. Wonder Boys is extremely high. It's going to be an extremely entertaining fight for all of us to watch. And um, again, anybody can win on any given day in the octagon. Darren Till punches like a, like a horse. You know, or like a bull or a mule, whatever the term is. Um, I don't want to be on the receiving end of one of those punches. And Stephen Wonderboy has a great ability to create distance, like Leota Machida with his karate MMA mix of style. Uh, his kicks are devastating. They can come at you from every, any single angle. His angles are awkward. Uh, great fight. Again, can't wait. Can't wait. Well, Till's backstory is quite interesting as well. I'm not sure if you know, but he grew up in Liverpool and he got stabbed twice in the back and he missed his artery by a couple inches or something so his coach said that being in these rough areas of a city was jeopardizing his mma career too much so they sent him to brazil where he studied muay thai for three years or something and now he's come back into the ufc with such caliber and such ferocity when he fights i think that's evident from backgrounds in being sent away to brazil fascinating story Great backstory for promotion as as fans watch. Um, I did not know that, and it heights my, heightens my respect for Darren even more. Well, what Darren Till is actually pushing for across all the social media is to bring the UFC to Liverpool and to the Echo Arena. Do you feel that the UFC will ever come to Liverpool? I hope so. I want to go to the place where the Beatles started. Are you kidding? <laughs> Absolutely. I want to go out to. I want to go have some fun Friday night in some of those pubs. And after the fight, let's do Liverpool. I'm game. I'm there. I'll roar. Well, it's a city that many consider to be the MMA capital of England. 
with such great prospects. I mean, Paddy Pimlet was on the UFC radar, and uh, Molly McCann is coming up, Chris Fishgold. It's such an MMA-centric city that if it doesn't sell out, I'll be shocked. If that doesn't sell out, we should all scratch our heads and wonder why. Well, moving away from Liverpool and some of this going on in the UFC now, Holloway Aldo 2 has been announced. Even with Aldo's prestige and status, do you think that Aldo deserves the rematch despite the likes of Cub Swanson going on a win streak and probably most deserved of the title? Yeah, you got to look at, at the pedigree of, of Jose Aldo and everything he's brought to the table. And the matchmakers, Dana White, all the powers that be at the UFC are fantastic at matching these fights. I have no problem with that matchup. I think it's one that's warranted and, and deserving. Um, I think it makes for a fan favorite. Let's see it. I know you're against it, but you willing to give a prediction? May the best may come on, Harry. You know me. <laughs> may the best man win. Good try, my friend. Just trying to squeeze answers out, yeah. That's okay. You you keep doing that. Don't worry. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of current events, you've been very busy over the past week with UFC 217. You were at UFC Norfolk over the weekend. Oh yes, uh, yeah, Norfolk, Virginia. Watch how you say that, Harry. Norfolk, <laughs> Virginia. <laughs> they have a chant in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, at, at one of the uh, fraternities. It's we don't drink, we don't smoke. Norfolk, Norfolk. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Norfolk, they like their MMA, and you were there to witness Matt Brown's elbow and Diego Sanchez, which is the most brutal knockout I have ever seen in an MMA ring. What was that like when the knockout hit? Jo Again, another jaw-dropping moment. Not a surprise from Matt Brown, um, one of my favorite people to watch fight. Another street fighter, uh, person that has his own demons from his background that proved to be a family man and a, and a warrior at the same time, doing very well for himself. Question was, would that be the last fight we would ever see him fight in the octagon? Um, you never know. He just came off one of the devastating wins. So I'm sure if I asked Matt and I went up to Matt and I said, Matt, is this your last fight? I'm sure I would have gotten like, well, not sure. I mean, once you win, even though you're planning on retiring, uh, it brings back a whole nother moment because everybody wants to see Matt Brown fight again after that night. So I think personally, my guess is we will see Matt again. He'll make a good deal for himself, get some good money for himself, and get more security for his family. I do predict we'll see him at some time in the future. Definitely. Hopefully we do because he looked so dominant in that fight. He didn't look like he was anywhere near finished with his MMA career. I'd be signing him right now. I wouldn't. I, I mean, I'm not a matchmaker. I'd be on the phone to him right now and say, let's let's lock this up. Well, from fighters at the end of their career to ones on the rise, you're so close to all of that action in the octagon. Are there any names that come to mind for you being amongst these warriors that you could see as the company's next big star, the next big draw in the company? Yeah, uh, uh, Kevin, who fought recently. Kevin Lee, who lost to Tony Ferguson. Yeah, Kevin Lee. Kevin Lee's got, he's got an it factor marketing uh, quality to him. He handles himself right, you know, doesn't get too crazy in his interviews, being and acting like an idiot if he, ha if he handles himself really well, which he seems to do. Um, I think he's got the ability, he has the looks, he has the marketable ability, he has a spectrum circle filled of what it takes to be a marketable fighter who has a chance with the skills to rise to the championship contest. So... There's a there's a fighter that I think we're going to see some fantastic things out of as time goes on. You know, we'll see how he handles himself. We'll see how he fights, and I think he's got a grand chance to be one of the stars, if not already, and as he is a star, but a star in the UFC. Definitely, someone who was called a rising star was Sage Northcutt, who obviously fought on the UFC Norfolk card, and he after he lost, he dipped like his MMA stocks per se dipped a bit. But now he looks like he's on the rise. Do you think he can make the rise that he was predicted to make? Or yes, I'll tell you why. Uh, Saturday, that's Saturday night when he got in the octagon. Uh, his corner is beside me, and the man that was throwing the corner at him was Uriah Faber. So he's obviously training with Alpha Male. When I saw, and his dad is in his corner too. When I saw him, you saw a Sage Northcutt that had a thirty percent difference in style that night. Why? It's because he's with Uriah Faber and Alpha Male. They took his great ability at karate. And his ability to fight. And you saw Sage do two furious spear takedowns. He's never done that before. He's been taken down and somewhat been a turtle wondering what to do because he was maturing as a fighter. I'm seeing Sage Northcutt maturing into a well-rounded mixed martial artist. This man, like George St. Pierre, possibly even more so, is an athletic phenomenon. You know, he's, he's uh, just like 
walked off Mount Olympus. You know, his physical yeah. abilities combined with mentally his discipline. He's one of the finest human beings I've ever met. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an example of the way – if everybody in America was – the youth of America was like Sage Northcutt, oh, my God, what, this country would be unbelievable. Um, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You know, polite, gentleman, uh, role model status. Can't say enough about Sage Northcutt. Can't say enough about wanting to watch as he matures as it goes on. Uh, and another fighter that he fought was Mickey Gall. After losing at the weekend, do you think he – it will make the rise again because he looked so talented. But you could argue that the people that he, he was was put in front of him, such as CM Punk, seems a bit of a you know like a, a record booster. Yeah, well, I don't know if it was a record booster. They needed somebody to fight CM Punk who had a one or two win fight or fight total in their repertoire because it wasn't fair to put CM Punk against a guy who had twenty fights. Oh, of course, yeah. So you know that fight was what it was. CM Punk showed as he showed. Um, Mickey Gall, you know, advanced in, in popularity and everything else. But Mickey Gall is another one that has a base of talent to mature in and become better and better. So he's a warrior. I talked to him after the fight. He's ready for his next fight. The mark of a champion, the mark of a warrior is, to, is, is you don't know what it's like to win until you know what it's like to lose, right? So when you do lose, it only makes you a better fighter if you are a quality individual and mentally can look at it and say, I want to be better. You have to let go of your ego in business and in fighting and sit down to base say, how can I make myself better? Step out of your circle and look at yourself objectively, not subjectively, and say, how can I perform better? I feel that Mickey Gall has that ability. Sage Northcliffe has that ability. Everybody we've talked about has that ability. At this level of A-level fighters in the UFC, if they don't, they should not be in the octagon. Definitely, and you don't improve without have, having to take a loss and having to having a real challenge that almost crushes you for you to come back. Absolutely, I still remember the the head eggs that I got from stepping up toe to toe in kickboxing against a guy I knew that was way better than me. But the fact that I you know performed, survived that at, whether you know looked better, looked worse, I definitely took shots. I definitely the guy was way better than me, but it made me better. It made me better the next time I went out to do whatever I did, you know, training in the world of martial arts as I've done in my lifetime. And on a pro level, uh, like these top fighters, these professional fighters, it's only magnified a thousand times. Exactly. Well, you brought up your kickboxing career. What motivates you to move on to, obviously you have the voice and you have the, the blood through your brother. Um, well, what motivates you to move away from kickboxing? To uh, con con concussions. <laughs> 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 but it, I was never a pro kickboxer. I, I, I've got three black belts in my training as a martial in martial arts since I was twelve. I trained in various styles, but the dojo training um, was great and it, it served its purpose. But if I was going to spar, I was going to fight. I wanted to fight for real, either get knocked out or take the other guy out. And kickboxing at that time in my life, which was before the UFC ever came on the scene, was the avenue for me. And I did it very heavily for ten years, but I suffered. At 32, what was my doctor's thought, second concussion, probably more like my third or fourth yeah. over the 10-year period. It was time to stop. You know, I'm not, I'm not a fighter. I'm not a professional fighter. I'm a fighter in life, but I'm not a professional fighter. I'm a businessman. And my doctor looked at me and said, is this how you make money? I go, no. You know, I own two companies. I do very well. He said, well, then stop. Just no more. Stop. So he said, otherwise, the symptoms you've been experiencing for the last couple of days, you're going to live with them from in your 40s on. So just stop. Well, and I did. I stopped. I stopped any fighting. I didn't stop training. I didn't stop training. Yeah. Well, you also trained in Tang Soo Do, didn't you? You're a black belt in. Yeah, I'm a second degree black belt in Tang Soo Do, which was Chuck Norris's original yeah. style that he started in Korea in the American Air Force when he was over there. And and I got into it training with Chuck Norris's fighting partners when I moved to California, who I met, and that was the beginning of um, you know my run there. Were well, you talking about um, concussions? What are your thoughts on fighters? like Mark Hunt per se who are recently or arguably to them uh, showing signs of like slurring words and stuff well I mean if that's the case you got to take a serious look at it I'm not privy to what his medicals are and I know Dana uh, made a decision based on Mark um, or the people at UFC made a decision based on Mark's um, self-admitting about what he was going through so if there's any danger to Mark then he should stop fighting if there's no danger to Mark and he's good to go based on the doctors then that's a decision he has to make for himself Exactly. I mean, um, you got to think about your family. You got to think about your future. Uh, well, we've been 
going on for a bit. I know you didn't have a, a lot of time, Bruce. Is there anything you want to plug or want to say before? Yeah, I, I, I can't. I can't wait to get back to the UK. I love performing over there. I just have so much fun. Aside from my love of Guinness and the in the pubs, <laughs> but but uh, I can't wait to get over there again. I hope to go there a couple times next year. And as far as anything, uh, the holidays are coming up. And one thing I offered all the fans: if you go to BruceBuffer.com, I have the special there with championship intros by me. I introduce you like a champion. Just if you're in the octagon, it's a keepsake for life as a UFC fan. I get I can't begin to tell you the letters I get back. It brings tears in my eyes how happy people are. Go to BruceBuffer.com. There's a holiday special there. It's I know it sounds like a lot, but it's ninety nine dollars. Believe me, I've been paid thousands for this. Okay. So um not not trying to tell my horn, but just saying this is a special I have there for the UFC fans. Okay. And aside from that, I do weddings, birthdays, um, audio and visual. You can get your, your introductions on video or audio. All the information is there. Just write my office. Um, and my office will reply for whatever your needs are. I love doing this because, again, the way the fans give me feedback, it's very fulfilling for me. And I devote part of the uh, earnings that I receive from that to charity. Well, it is such a unique gift as well. And such a, if you present a UFC fan with a personalized message, it's, you know, that can really like hit home for someone. I'm, I'm happy to do it, my friend. Happy to do it. <laughs> well, Bruce, thank you so much for speaking to me again speaking to all our attack and coming on uh, my pleasure my pleasure and i sincerely hope to see you in the uk soon hopefully in liverpool i you know i want to be there <laughs> <laughs> and i'll do my best to be there um for everybody and say say hello and cheers all right cheers bruce all right harry thanks so much